Okay, um, so I think we're recording now. Um, yeah, okay, great. Uh, so uh, I'm thrilled today to have one of my favorite scientists on the call today, uh, Steve Omohundro. So Steve has actually um, influenced Numenta in a couple of different ways. So as most of you at Numenta already know, Steve was my PhD advisor uh, while he was a professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and then at UC Berkeley. So that's a Numenta connection. Um, but he was also the thesis advisor for Bartlett Mill, and Bartlett was the first to propose that active dendritic properties in pyramidal neurons could exist and have a computational impact. So that work on active dendrites, uh, you know, has certainly impacted us quite a bit at, uh, in our models. Um, it's kind of hard to characterize Steve and the wide variety of work he's done over the years. Uh, so he has a PhD in theoretical physics from UC Berkeley. He's been a professor of computer science. Uh, he's been an entrepreneur and has founded several companies. He has created two programming languages that were widely used, uh, StarLisp, which was the parallel language used on the connection machine uh, at Thinking Machines Corp. And Sather, which was an object-oriented language uh, he developed at Berkeley that I used for, for many years. Uh, he's done quite a bit of work in cryptography, both in research and in industry. Um, maybe sort of more relevant uh, to today's uh, discussion, Steve has worked in machine learning, computer vision, natural language processing, and AI since the late 80s. Um, he's conversant in just about every machine learning algorithm you can imagine. Um, and more recently, he's been spending a lot of time thinking about and talking about the implications of AI on society uh, and the ethical uh, implications of all that. Uh, he's currently the chief scientist and a board member at AI Brain, which is a company creating new AI technologies for learning, conversation, robotics, simulation, and music. Uh, so today's talk actually came out of a, a discussion I had with Steve a couple of weeks ago. Um, we were talking about GPT-3 and it became clear that the advances that are going on in natural language processing today are quite startling. Uh, there are many interesting questions um, that are being raised. And I thought Steve uh, would be the perfect person to kind of lead a discussion on this at Nementa. So thank you so much, Steve, for coming and, and talking to us today. Oh, thank you. So happy to be here. And um, yeah, Subhutai and I were talking about the implications of GPT-3 and just, it's hard to wrap your head around what's happening. Um, just to sort of highlight that, this morning it was announced that Google uh, announced or released G-Shard, which is a 600 billion weight model, and there are rumors that people are working on trillion weight models. And so we're in this period where these things are just growing dramatically. And so understanding like what the implications of that are, both scientifically for intelligence and technologically and socially, I think it's super, super important. Uh, Subutai and I had a great conversation. He suggested, hey, let's uh, broaden, broaden it. And so I'm really happy to be here. I'd be happy to just do it interactively. I put together some slides, but we can delve into any part that's especially interesting. Um, so I don't know the best way to uh, you know, just cut in and, and uh, make a comment or a question. I'll share yeah, my... just Yeah, feel free to drop in. I'll also monitor kind of the participants. If you raise your hand, I can, I can call on you, but um, just, just it'll be easiest just to jump in probably. Yeah, great. Can everybody see the uh, slides there? Yeah, okay, great. <clears throat> so uh, OpenAI has, so the transformer model is the thing that's been really shaking up natural language uh, ever since uh, 2017 when it was introduced. And there are a whole bunch of variants of it. And uh, OpenAI uh, produced a very simple variant that they call GPT. And uh, about a year and a half ago, they came out with GPT-2, which was you know quite, uh, influential and you know they didn't release the model because it was too dangerous to release and uh, then eventually they did release it and people have been using it and so just a few weeks ago they released this GPT-3 which is you know 10 times as big and super super powerful and it seems to be exhibiting some new kinds of emergent behaviors that uh, potentially could be very important and so that's what Subutai and I were talking about. So I'd like to go through today, give you just a, a rough outline of what the model is, you know, what it looks like, uh, what its scaling behavior is, where it seems to be going as these models get bigger and bigger, um, how it relates to all this word embedding, sentence embedding, document embedding ideas, and, and the, something called distributional semantics. So where, how does meaning come into this class of model? Uh, and then a characteristic of these, which is very different, some people are calling it software 3.0, which is instead of you know, writing a program or building a neural net model and training it, you instead give a prompt 
to one of these big models and it figures out from your prompt in English what it is you want it to do. And so it's kind of a remarkable thing. It's sort of hard, it's almost like magic. Does this really work? But I'll show you some examples where it does. So uh, we'll go through that sequence and at any point you've got questions or comments, let's, let's talk about it. So GPT-3 is a language model and uh, this just means uh, it assigns probabilities to word sequences. So give me any sequence of words uh, in English though, this thing is trained on a big chunk of the internet. And so it actually knows a lot about other languages too, remarkably. And in fact, it can do translation right out of the box, but it's primarily English. Um, any kind of a probability model like this can always be factored as a product of the probability of each word conditioned on the previous words. And the simplest form of language model is an n-gram model where you, you know, like a bigram model is you just take the two previous words uh, you predict the next word based on that, and you can build those models just by recording from a big data set how often uh, trigrams occur, and then you can use that to predict uh, future words. And so people have been doing that for years, and starting around 2000, these n-gram models started beating all of these very complex linguist design models. And so that was sort of, I would say, maybe one of the early wake-up calls that these big compute-heavy, data-heavy models may supplant the clever, you know, human created detailed models. Like uh, I, I uh, visited the Psych project back in the 90s where they had teams of linguists, you know, putting all the detail about the world into these systems. Well, all of that's been supplanted by, by simple statistics. From that perspective, you can think of GPT-3 as a 2048 gram model since it predicts the probabilities of the next word based on a context window of 2048 uh, tokens. And here's what the architecture of the model looks like. Uh, you take the context window, 2048 tokens. Each token is mapped into a vector in a, in a real vector space uh, through this embedding matrix. So that's sort of the first set of weights is in how do you uh, map tokens into this vector space. And then everything else is done uh, in vector spaces. And the whole pipeline that it goes through is these 2048 um, vectors uh, get transformed uh, into another layer of 2048, another layer of 2048, another layer of 2048. This block here is the transformer block. And in GPT-3, there are 96 of these. So 96 layers of doing this transformer thing. And inside the transformer, the key thing, the, the part that makes it magic is this thing called self-attention. And I'll say what that is in case you haven't seen it. And then there's some more traditional uh, feed forward networks in there also. So you get 96 layers of that. And then finally at the end, you have one more um, feed forward uh, neural net. And then you have a soft max, which converts weights, uh, con converts values to probabilities. And it's those probabilities are uh, the probability of the next token. So given a, an input of 2048 tokens, it's going to give you a probability distribution over what the next token is. And from that basic thing, you can do all kinds of stuff. And uh, that seems to be sort of the style of the modern model. So what is a transformer? What's the self-attention thing? So a convolutional network takes a sequence of input vectors and uh, the output vectors are um, uh, weighted combinations of these vectors. Uh, usually it's the nearby ones get combined in some way to produce something. Those have been very influential in image processing, a little bit in, in language. Uh, transformers are similar, except that um, each of the input vectors uh, goes through three matrices to produce a value vector, a key vector, and a query vector. And the output vector is going to be a weighted linear, linear combination of the value vectors of the input. And the way that you decide on the weights, this is the attention piece, is the vector you're interested in, its query vector is dot product with the key vector of each of the other uh, vectors in the input. And those dot products uh, are then normalized and serve as the weights to combine the value vectors. So it's basically just a linear combination of the value vectors, but where the, the weights are determined by this self-attention mechanism. And then these, the matrices which produce this value key and query vector, those are all learned in the system. The whole thing is trained uh, through backpropagation end to end uh, to achieve a uh, high probability of predicting the next word on the training set. So that's, so it's sort of the most vanilla uh, auto regressive language model you can imagine with the one extra twist is that we use this sort of slightly odd uh, attention mechanism in the middle of it. And that's all it is just scaled up to be really big, and yet it does amazing things. 
Um, oh, one other comment, because it's an autoregressive model, that means it's trying to predict the next word from the previous words, the self-attention is masked, so it only looks at previous words. There are other variants of transformers. BERT is probably the most famous one, which take a different approach, and they can actually uh, have self-attention of, of context both on uh, before and after. But GPT-3 uh, only looks at the uh, previous stuff. Steve, I have a question before you go on. Um, as you talk about this, it's all in the context of language. Um, but this uh, idea of this uh, sort of self-query attention mechanism, is that something that you view as the field views as language, or is that something, a general capability that would apply to many different domains? Is it a language solution, or is it a general purpose solution? Well, I think it's especially important in language because uh, what it gives you is it gives you long distance connections, which language uses a lot. But people are taking this self-attention thing and they're just dropping it unchanged into say convolutional networks for image recognition and they're improving performance. And then uh, OpenAI recently did ex almost exactly the same model for predicting, you know, you give me the top half of an image and it predicts the bottom half of the image by going pixel by pixel. And it just sort of fills in the bottom half pixel by pixel and it's remarkable the kinds of things that it has learned. Very high level semantic seeming things. So it seems to be a kind of very general uh, intelligence uh, element that can be applied in all sorts of domains. It's also kind of random. I mean, there are several different uh, alternatives for self-attention that people propose. This one is a very efficient to run on uh, GPUs. And so I'm not at all convinced this is the optimal way to do it, but it seems to, it seems to work. And uh, there's starting to be papers now exploring the space of what are you know, possible self-attention mod modules. All right, great, thanks. Um, so the, the, uh, these models seem to do better as they get bigger. And since they were introduced in uh, you know, 2018 or something, uh, they've been growing exponentially. And we see that trend continuing as of th this morning's announcement from Google. Um, and uh, basically every big AI lab has been building this kind of variants of this kind of model and applying it to, to a number of different, different tasks. Um, the GPT-3 uh, architecture, they actually built uh, eight different versions of it with different sizes so that they could see how scaling was going. The biggest version is 175 billion weights. And um, the pipeline, it starts with a, a reversible encoding of, um, you know, you'd like to, you know, conceptually, you're just encoding words as vectors. But in these big data sets, you often see, you know, things that are in Unicode, or you see words that you've never seen before. So they, they generally want a more general kind of encoding. And so uh, something called byte pair encoding has become very popular, where you say, choose a certain number of tokens, say 50,000 tokens, and then you look for the most common pairs uh, in your training set, and you merge those into uh, larger symbols, and that way you get uh, you get common words get encoded as a single token, but also subwords get encoded, so that even if you see something new that's made up of components that you've seen before, you maybe have some sense of it. So that that's a kind of a hacky thing that a lot of these systems are doing. I'm guessing eventually this will be replaced by something which uses learning for real end-to-end -end learning, but at the moment they 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 do it this way. They have a context window of 2048 tokens. They have 96 transformer layers. Uh, each layer has that attention module, like I mentioned, but they actually do 96 attention heads in parallel so that different attention heads can discover different phenomena. So like one attention head might look for, you know, um, the direct object of a verb. Another one might look for the indirect object. And so somehow it's gonna, the system through backprop is gonna figure out what to do with all of these heads. There's a lot of work these days. Do you really need 96? Does it help to have more? Uh, do different layers need different numbers of heads? All those questions are kind of uh, unknown, I would say at the moment. Uh, each of these heads produces 128 dimensional vector and they're all just concatenated to form the vector for the next layer. Uh, they have 12,288 uh, units in the first of the um, multi-layer perceptron uh, unit and 49,152 in the next one. They train it with a batch size of 3.2 million samples and they have this as their learning rate. So that's basically all the knobs that there are in making this thing. So it's quite generic really. Um, the training data is uh, 499 billion tokens. Uh, some people estimated the cost of training it would be $12 million 
uh, though somebody figured out on the cheapest GPU cloud, you could do it for $4,600,000, but it would take 355 years. So uh, quite a you know, substantial training task, though actually running it, doing inference is not that expensive. Uh, they estimate just a few cents to generate on the order of 10 pages of text. Is, is that to do one training run on it? Uh, uh, a complete training. Uh, one so, complete. And presumably you have to do it several times to, while debugging and getting doing hyperparameter tuning. Yeah, well, in fact, if you read the paper, one of the worries is some of the tests that they tested on, uh, those tests may appear on the web and so might end up in their training data inadvertently. And they accidentally did have some leakage like that. But it was too expensive to go back and retrain it. And so instead, they tried to account for that in their reporting. So, so, so I just to be clear, they're actually spending that kind of money to build these models? Well, the reality is, so this is OpenAI. OpenAI was started a few years back as a kind of uh, trying to make sure that AI has a positive social benefit. And it was a, a, a nonprofit corporation and you know investment from Elon Musk. Well, about a year or so ago, they decided, Elon Musk left the board. They decided, you know, we're not nonprofit anymore. We're going to be a for-profit company. And Microsoft invested uh, a billion dollars into them. And it turns out Microsoft built the supercomputer that they used to train this thing on. And uh, I'm guessing there's some sort of internal accounting where Microsoft, you know, donated a billion dollars, but then some of that comes back to them for running this supercomputer. And I'm also guessing that the, the Microsoft uh, data center will be one of the first to use this type of model. Uh, and so there's some kind of, you know, agreements going on back and forth. And they, they also announced recently that they have an API to this model, which they're going to start uh, licensing out for uh, end users to use. So yeah. some kind of complex business model and research and uh, but uh, exactly okay, I get, that's great. That's helpful. Uh, but in the end, there is a lot of computing time that's being spent that's costing money. On this. Yes, absolutely. This, yeah, I mean, so uh, maybe it's a lot less than the twelve million dollars you mentioned, but it's going to be in the millions. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Uh, and okay. it's both the equipment you're using, and it's also power. This thing is using a lot of power <laughs> in training, not in not in execution. So. Uh, here's what the source of it is. Uh, the bulk of the data is just web data, but they used Reddit. You know, Reddit rates things, and so they used highly rated uh, things that are highly rated on Reddit as a kind of curation for what web pages might be more valuable than others. Uh, they have a, all of Wikipedia, a bunch of books, um, and uh, I think they in the training. I think the really high quality stuff like Wikipedia, they trained it repeatedly. Uh, and the low quality random uh, web stuff, I think they trained only once, that kind of thing. So some kind of choices made there. Uh, here's more details on the supercomputer. It, it's all based on NVIDIA V100 GPUs. Uh, they have, they have uh, 285,000 CPU cores and 10,000 GPU cores, each with a pretty high connect network connectivity on each GPU server. So this is a pretty big data farm. <laughs> I assume they're using it for other things. I don't really know. Uh, and they traded, trained it using a PyTorch model, using uh, the CUDA um, deep neural net um, uh, version of it. Do you know how long it's been? Uh, yep. Do you know how long it's been? Uh, sorry? Like, uh, in time, do you know how long it took? You know, I don't. Um, I, I haven't seen that anywhere. But I get the sense it's on the order of weeks, kind of. Um, I just presumed it was less than 400 years. So yeah. I'd oh yeah. That, exactly. <laughs> I put that as an upper bound, but yeah. And uh, and it's an interesting thing about you know um, academic research labs probably don't have access to this kind of compute power, and so this may be you know if you know the future of AI models requires this kind of compute, that could be you know uh, Subutai and I are, we're talking about the sort of trade offs in versus China versus the U.S. in building uh, doing AI development. Uh, it may be that just raw compute power is a really critical component. So here's their super graph of uh, um, a few, about a year or so ago, they, they analyzed all of the transformer models and they found um, various scaling relationships, the most important of which is the loss of a model versus the compute power when you optimize everything else, the amount of training data, the size of the model and all that. And uh, they found this really simple, nice relationship. And uh, these show the curves for different sized um, GPT models. This is their smallest one, and this is the new one, the really big one. 
and they all seem to be lying quite accurately on this curve, and there doesn't seem to be any sign that, um, you know, that, that it's getting saturated. So I would expect that as we scale up, maybe to this Google 600 billion weight one, maybe even, you know, trillion, 10 trillion weight models, we're probably still going to be on this curve, and we're going to be kind of getting, uh, at least in terms of test set, val test set loss, uh, just increasing improvement just with, with more compute and more data. Steve, I have a very basic question. Yeah. The, the term loss, is that, can I consider that like the error rate? Is that what you mean there? Uh, it, yeah, it's the pre how predictive you are of the training data. And in fact, a better, um, more intuitive thing is perplexity. And I'll, I'll talk about, so perplexity is, uh, you know, what is your uncertainty about the next word? So you've just seen a bunch of words in a piece of text. You're trying to predict the next word. And uh, perplexity is if you had a case-sided dice and, and the uncertainty about the next word is like throwing that case-sided dice, the K is the perplexity. It's two to the entropy of the distribution of the next word. And uh, if you just do unigram statistics, the perplexity is about 962. So you know, if, you, if you just guess what a word is gonna be, it's about a one in 962. Bigrams gives you 170, trigrams 109. GPT-2 broke records in perplexity about a year or so ago. It was 35.8. GPT-3 now breaks a new record, 20.5. It's not exactly clear what the human perplexity is, how well humans can predict the next word in a piece of text, but various estimates from different sides suggest it's around 12. And if you plot the best perplexity over time on this uh, particular test, the Penn Tree Bank, uh, it seems to be decreasing pretty steadily and uh, here's GPT-3, and so uh, if this continues, it looks like it'll be about a year before these systems are at the human level, uh, estimated human level. Um, it also saw, you know, one of the things GPT-3 is good at, as was GPT-2, is generating text. So if you give it the start of, a, of a, an essay, you give it some words, and you say, generate the next word, then take that and generate the next word, take that, generate the next word. It generates pretty cohesive, you know, elegant essays on that topic. And um, it, with GPT-3, they generate some essays and then they take human written essays and then they go to a bunch of humans to try and figure out which ones were computer generated, which ones were human generated. So it's kind of a variant of the Turing test where there's no interaction. It's just, you know, the system generated some text and they've been finding the ability of humans to tell what was fake and what was real has been steadily decreasing. And with GPT-3, it's essentially at 50-50 now. Uh, it's like 52% uh, they can detect the machine. And so we're essentially at the point where these machines can generate text you can't tell, you can't distinguish from human generated. So all of this sort of uh, is, is data that backs up uh, what, what uh, Rich Sutton, who's a, a, a long-term AI researcher who wrote the best textbook on reinforcement learning. He came out with an influential essay a year or so ago he called The Bitter Lesson. And his bitter lesson was that a simple AI that leverages computer power will eventually beat out clever AI built using human knowledge. And he argued that that was true with chess, that people had all these clever, complicated chess playing programs. And then Deep Blue basically just did a fairly brute force uh, search and beat that. Uh, more recently, we've had AlphaGo beat Go using, you know, self-play with some simple learning and some search to beat Go. And then these language models uh, are really showing that first with n-grams and now these transformer models especially, that they seem to just be doing better and better and better as it gets bigger. And then there are a bunch of other recent uh, experiments on different kinds of AI tasks where it looks like scaling with uh, compute power is just, you know, beating everything. So that's sort of a tragic conclusion for those of us that really, you know, love to deeply understand things. But hey, it's the, maybe the reality. And uh, I think OpenAI has taken that to heart. Uh, their chief scientist recently quoted, he says, give GPT-2 the compute, give it the data, and it will do amazing things. And so I'm guessing their business model involves just scaling things up, and it sounds like Google's doing that too. There's another way to look at these models to try and understand what is it that they're doing? Like you were asking, this transform, this uh, self-attention unit, is that general? Is that, what is that? Um, and uh, one of the really insightful ways of understanding this is through word embeddings. And this has been kind of an industry in the natural language world uh, for the last few years. Um, initially, they were just static word embeddings. And so Basically, you wanted to take all the words in English and each word should be represented by a vector in some vector space. 
And you'd like words which have similar meaning to get mapped to vectors which are near to one another. And uh, that turns out to be pretty easy. But it turns out they actually capture a lot more relational information. And I'll say a bit about that in a second. Um, but, you know, an English word has different meanings in different contexts. So the word bank could either be a place you put your money or it could be a river bank, the side of a river. And so knowing the context that you're in makes a big difference. And so after these initial uh, things like word to vec glove, fast text, which were static word emb embeddings, a whole bunch of models came out which used the context of a word and it, it uh, encoded a word as, as a vector, but within a given context. And then more recently, they've been encoding sentences as vectors and documents as vectors, books as vectors. And so, you know, that whole world has been just exploding in a bunch of models. And you can think of the BERT transformer GPT models as, as in the space of converting uh, things to vectors in a much more complex way. Steve, and I have a question for you, which sure. is when you talk about these as vectors and encoding the context and all that stuff, is there any sense in these models of temporal structure, any difference between the last word and the word before that and the word before that, or is it all kind of collapsed into a spatial representation? Yeah, that's a really uh, crit critical piece of uh, question. Uh, and they've gone all over the place. Um, the, a lot of the early um, models used what they call bag of words, which is they treat a sentence just as whatever words are in there and they completely ignore the order. Um, the self-attention operation uh, doesn't, it's, it's permutation invariant. It doesn't know anything about what the ordering of words are, but what they've done, something I didn't mention, they've um, added a, an extra input which encodes the position in the input using a pretty complicated set of sines and cosines that they claim, you know, fits naturally into the self-attention model. And so that um, the GPT model knows all about position as do the, the word, uh, as do like BERT and those other ones. And so uh, certainly in language, position is really important. You know, uh, the man hit the dog is very different from the dog hit the man. Um, and so, um, so these more modern models are really using it, but it's coming in in a sort of a, a implicit way uh, that's maybe a little different than you might've thought. Um, so here's, you know, the, the early shock of the static word models like word to vec and glove was that not only did they map similar meaning words to similar locations, they had these equations. And the most famous one was king minus man plus woman equals queen. So if you took the vector for the word king, uh, subtracted from it the vector for the word man and added that to the vector for the word woman, you would get the vector for the word queen. And in fact, um, a whole bunch of pairs where there's a sort of masculine feminine version like uh, oh, I don't know, brother, sister, um, grandfather, grandmother, they're all related by vectors which are quite similar. And in fact, a whole bunch of relationships like between a country and its capital, France and Paris, Italy, Rome, those vectors are all the same. Um, Miami, uh, you know, a, a city, a, a popular city and the state that it's in, uh, a famous person and what their job was, um, you know, uh, an element and its symbol, uh, company and what its product is. So a whole bunch of these relational information, fairly coarse relational information also gets encoded in these models, which is sort of the first hint that, gee, maybe some semantics is really getting mapped into these things. I just want to go back to that slide, Steve. I just want to point out, if you go down to the bottom of those lists, you see Microsoft, Palmer, IBM McNeely, Apple Jobs, but Google seems to be run by Yahoo. Oh, <laughs> I didn't actually, notice that one. That's funny. <laughs> there's actually a bunch of errors in there. Putin to Medvedev is different than Obama to Barack. Uh, France to Tapas is not correct. I mean, there's actually errors in this. So it's oh yeah. Well, so this this chart is not from GPT three. This chart I think is from the Word to Vec, which is that core static uh, thing. Uh, but even in GPT three, you know, it's trained on web data, and so. That's one of the challenges in terms of social implications. If these models start getting into very important central things, you know, they may have bias. There's a lot of discussion about bias in learned models these days. They may have incorrect things. How do you have any sense of that? Yeah, it's correct enough and it's good and we can trust it. And so I, I think there's a lot of interesting issues and work to be done on that side. Uh, and so, so it's, in some sense, this is sort of these hacky things that it's like a little kid, like a four-year-old just learns things from what they happen to hear. And uh, these models are learning things from what they happen to see on the internet. 
Uh, it's mostly Reddit, which is <laughs> and mostly Reddit. Yeah, mostly well, Reddit, things that though, Reddit yeah. points to, I think, is the yeah. way. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, that's the human condition, also, right? <laughs> so somehow the human brain is able to take this cacophony of random stuff. Some of it's true, some of it's not, and form some kind of cohesive uh, view. Yeah, my mother can't keep track of Google versus Yahoo. She's confused about that too. <laughs> Um, so getting to your point about temporal information and, you know, language is all about much more complex structures. Um, at the next level, it turns out for uh, these uh, BERT-like models, um, if you look at the embeddings that they create, um, they, they create trees in the vector space that correspond to the parse tree, the linguistic parse tree. So even though there's nothing in classical linguistics built into these models, it turns out they actually rediscover a number of things. So there's a whole field now that people are calling BERTology. BERT was sort of the, mo the first and most prominent of these models. And so people have been analyzing, what are these BERT models learning? And they're looking particularly as you go down the different layers, what kind of information are the vectors in these different deeper and deeper layers? What are they encoding? And so uh, this paper, what it discovered is that uh, eight sequences in a classical natural language processing pipeline that used to be human built are sort of showing up in the multiple in the layers, the deeper and deeper layers of BERT. So uh, early layers discover the part of speech, uh, what constituents there are, what the dependencies between things are, what the entities in a sentence are, the semantic role labeling of entities, co-reference between you know pronouns and, and nouns, semantic proto roles, and then relation classification. And so it's kind of remarkable that an end to the end um, backprop trained model appears to be discovering some of what classical linguistics uh, has, has tried to figure out. Um, and I think this plays to something uh, really fundamental. In linguistics, their notion of semantics, like I would say probably the dominant um, notion of semantics is Montague semantics, which tries to map structures in language into um, some form, logical formalism. They used a typed uh, lambda calculus, uh, was what Montague was promoting. I think that's still probably the dominant way of thinking about it. But back in the 1950s, there were alternatives. And the one that seems to be driving what's going on now, sometimes it's called distributional semantics. And one of the early advocates was this uh, gentleman, John Firth. And his most famous uh, phrase was, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. And so his idea is that the semantics of a word is the, the probability distribution over the, uh, wor over the words in the context of, in which it can appear. And so you can figure out that dog and cat are similar because dog and cat can appear in similar sentences. You know, the man took the dog for a walk, the man took the cat for a walk. And so because all the context in which those words can appear, that, that's where their similarity comes from. And his idea was that all of the semantics of language comes from that kind of syntactic or so that kind of statistical structure. And I think that's being borne out by these statistical models. Question? Yeah. Uh, how would you contrast that with uh, Chomsky's uh, deep structure notions? You know, I don't know Chomsky all that well, but I think he believed that the human brain was born with a lot of linguistic knowledge built in, that we know all about the kinds of syntactic structures which are allowed, and that when a small child learns a language, they're like setting the parameters for a built-in language model. He never really explained where these language models came from, given that human language is only 250,000 years old, you know. Um, and so I think he assumed that there's a lot more structure built in, whereas these models, you know, have basically no structure. What about sort of George Lakoff's stuff where meaning is much more grounded in kind of your sensory modalities and the actions you do and, and stuff? Yeah, like that. I, I think uh, that's really interesting. And, you know, well, I'll talk a little bit later that uh, I have, so I, I'll say it now. Um, so I used to have a, a great thought experiment, which was, let's say you're a really good pattern recognizer, statistical learner, and you just watch TV all day. Can you learn about the world from that? And it seemed to me that you could, that basically you'd very quickly discover the notion of frames, uh, of you know, TV frames, you uh, you know, know, know about like what, what pixels are near one another in the, in the picture, and then pretty soon you'd realize that, oh, there are you know, blobs of color that tend to move together, and then you discover there are objects, and then you'd probably build 3D models of those to, as best explanations for objects rotating. And then you'd maybe discover the laws of physics, you maybe discover how 
that there are these things called humans that sort of move in complicated ways and maybe start getting psychology. And then you could tie it to the language that they were using and that would ground the language in meaning. And so it seemed to me like you could make a credible argument that given enough TV and a smart enough uh, pattern recognizer, you could build a pretty good model of the world from that. But it seemed to me back then that if, let's say, you just heard radio, you listened to the radio all day, uh, that, that'd be hopeless. So you hear these sounds and you'd be nothing you could do. This is sort of, I think, arguing the opposite of that. And maybe I'll skip ahead to a, a, a slide showing uh, the kinds of things that you can, real world semantics that's implicit in GPT-2, um, it can discuss, it knows, so after being trained just on web text, uh, you can then probe it by asking questions. Like, let's say, does it know what the president of the United States is? You can say, the president of the United States is blank, and then it's supposed to fill it in, and it would say the highest probability word is Trump. Or, um, you know, so you can use that kind of, of statement to extract the knowledge that's sort of uh, in, these, in these systems. And using that, people have found it knows all the US presidents and Russian leaders in temporal order. It knows the latitude and longitude of cities in the United States and Europe and their relative distances. It knows the relative size of many objects like cars, elephants, humans, and houses. It knows, and you can test that by things like, is a, is a human bigger than an elephant? or uh, an elephant is bigger than a human. Which of those phrases has higher probability? And it knows. Uh, what animals are dangerous? What objects are dangerous? How smart different animals are? What clothing is appropriate for different age groups, for different emotional arousal, for cost, for different weather conditions? The qualities of mythological character creatures, physical properties of objects like rigidness, strength, transparency, whole part relations, you know, that the hand is a part of an arm and an arm is a part of a body. Um, Countries and cities, their capitals, their gross domestic product, their internet usage, all that kind of stuff. So all this information, and you know, some of this is explicitly in the training set, but some of it uh, sort of emerges from it. And somehow these models uh, seem to be capturing this kind of semantic information. And so suddenly, if you start seeing that, you can now imagine that uh, a, a smart learner just listening to the radio could figure out you know, what the objects are, what the categories of those objects are, which objects are, are so, most similar to one another, uh, what, their, what the actions tend to be, what simplified intuitive laws of physics might be, what intuitive sort of uh, psychology might be. You could build up probably a pretty good model of the world just from sufficient amounts of text. So that's my current stance. Uh, I'm happy to hear arguments against it if anybody disagrees. Um, so just to be specific, you're saying that there's no need to have any sort of a, uh, action or uh, you know, motor command or sensory motor loop or anything like that. You could just be a passive observer uh, yeah, I, and, and get there. I think, I think certainly interacting is very helpful. You can learn things much, much more quickly. So, so here's my little uh, chart on exactly that, which is, you know, Biological organisms are interacting with the world. That lets them probe you know, aspects that they don't know well. They try something, and I think they're very driven by when mistakes are made. You, know, you, try, you uh, push on something, you predict something's going to happen, something else happens, then you're really interested, and you start you know, playing around with it. And so I think it's very helpful for building models of the world. Um, one step removed from that is a simulated, like a video game of the world. And that's probably as good. Uh, I now think that, yeah, you don't really need that interaction. I think it speeds things up, but I think if you have a sufficient amount of raw video uh, and you just do a good statistical model of it, that you can build up the, those kinds of things. And now I'm starting to lean toward, uh, you know, a language stream is sufficient also. And so, so that is a, you know, sort of a, a radical shift in my perspective and, and I think maybe in, in other people's perspective as well. Um, so the other, so related to that is this other piece, which is um, some people are calling this GPT-3 type of interaction. So the old style model, well, the old style neural nets were you design a neural net for a specific task. Like let's say you want to do sentiment analysis. You want to look at movie reviews on Netflix. And is this a positive review or a negative review? The way, the way you used to do that is you take a bunch of reviews and you have humans label them. Yeah, this is positive, this is negative. You build a special purpose neural net and you train it on that task. Then they kind of got the idea, OMFIT, I think was the thing that shifted people from that view to a kind of transfer learning view. 
where um, you train a big, big model on maybe you know, unsupervised le learning tasks. And then once you've got a good uh, model of language, you then put a little teeny layer on top that's specific to the particular task you care about, say sentiment analysis. And then you train just that extra little bit. And that has been the paradigm over the last few years. And so uh, the first thing maybe uh, would be, you know, so the old days of software 1.0, where you design an algorithm to do something. Uh, software 2.0 was you design the neural net and you train it to do something. The new paradigm is you don't even do any training. You just build a huge language model and then you describe in English what you want it to do. And uh, these models are able to do that somewhat. And so whether this is really going to be the new paradigm, software people you know that's going to supplant these other things or not, I think it's way too early to tell. But the fact that this is even possible is kind of mind blowing. And so Just, let me show you some examples. Um, oh. uh, comments? Uh, uh, I'll, I'll wait till later. Keep going. So um, in this GPT-3, they train it once on this big, huge corpus, and that's it. Once it's trained, they freeze the weights. They never touch the weights again. On the other hand, as you run it, it's doing this attention thing. So the attention weights are changing all the time. And some people are thinking of those attention weights as a kind of fast weight or weight that is sort of dynamically dependent on what the input is. And so in that way, you might think of it as a kind of neural training, but in its inference. And so uh, in their tests, they did three kinds of tests. They call zero shot, one shot, and few shot. And so is it, let's say they want to translate from English to French. Notice it was never taught about translation, just that there's some web page out there that happens to say, oh, the translation of this word in French is this in English. And that's all it's using to figure out what translation means. And so the zero shot version is you just say, translate English to French cheese. And then you ask, then you put this little arrow symbol, and then uh, you hope it figures out to say fromage here. And remarkably, often it does for, for many of these tasks. You can give it a little more, uh, context for what you mean by giving it one example, which is you say, translate English to French, sea otter goes to l'outre de mer, what does cheese go to? That helps it a little bit. Or you can give it a bunch of examples that they call few shot, and they put enough examples in here to fill up their context window, which is 2048 tokens, and they say that's typically somewhere between 10 and 100 examples. So that's the three um, settings in which they test this thing on a bunch of tasks. And here's a typical kind of simple task where they take words and they stick a garbage symbol in the middle of the word and the job of the system is to remove the garbage symbol and they show how their small small system does on it the medium sized system and then their biggest one and as a function of the number of examples they give in the context and for the big system you know given one example of what you want it to do is pretty good that's you know that it can do a, a quite a credible job uh, on just given one example, and then as you give it more examples, it does better and better. So it's a very weird way of programming, um, and yet, you know, that's the, the 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 framing in which they do do everything here. And they do a bunch of different uh, tasks, something like uh, you know 25 or something like that. And this is sort of overall how it does on zero shot, one shot, and two shot. So having more examples in the input definitely helps it, and having bigger models helps it a lot. 42 different uh, benchmarks that they did it on. And many of these benchmarks are standard, really hard benchmarks. Superglue is a standard natural language processing benchmark, which you know, requires all kinds of you know, figuring out like uh, what sentences follow from what other sentences and what things entail other things. So these are not trivial tasks in, in many cases. What, it's what basically would, hard on a lot of them, but not on all of them. Yes. What would be a typical human performance on these curves? You know, that's a good question. I'm not really sure. Uh, for something like this one, um, you know, once a human gets that, oh, they're putting an asterisk in the middle of the word, I'm supposed to remove the asterisk, the human would really quickly go to 100%. So that shows that these things are not operating in the same way that humans are. Uh, they're not really figuring out, you know, the, the abstract notion of what the intention is here. They're doing something in between. And in fact, my final slide here is uh, talking about Kenneman's uh, uh, thinking fast and slow, type one versus type two uh, thinking. So, so in human, human thinking, there seems to be at least two forms of thinking, one which is unconscious and rapid, which they call type one, and one which is deliberative, conscious, and involves reasoning, which they call type two. 
seems to me, and I think other people are starting to think that, that deep learning in general and these kinds of models specifically are really doing a good job of type one learning, very rapid, but not multi-step. And uh, for many of these tasks, you would do a lot better if you had real multi-step reasoning. And so I think sort of where AI is going, I think is to take this kind of immediate model and combine it with uh, planning and reasoning type of systems. Although if it's generating, you know, entire essays, you know, to me, that seems like it's more than just a type one kind of thinking, yeah. isn't it? You know, the thing is, I don't think it's really planning those essays um, in the sense of it's not like sequentially considering different um, th things that it might end up on. I think it has built in some kind of high level semantic knowledge and it figures out what semantics it wants the essay to have and then it sort of lets it play out. So, so it is, you know, it's sort of like when people speak, I think um, most uh, language speaking is also not, I'm not planning out what I'm going to say in the next sentence. I'm sort of letting it sort of emerge from, from a structure that's there. Whereas a really good essayist will figure out, you know, oh yeah, to, I want to have this emotional impact and to do that, I need to go here. So, so um, but yeah, I think I, I, good point. And you'll see some of the, the uh, training examples also feel like they have a sequential character to them. So th it's an interesting question. Um, oh, in particular, this one. So one of the controversial things is, uh, and they, people were, were arguing about this about GPT-2, is it can do certain forms of arithmetic. And so if you ask GPT-2, you know, what is 22 plus 33, it'll give you an answer. And sometimes it gets the answer right and sometimes not. Uh, and so people were hypothesizing that basically if it saw a particular problem on the internet somewhere, it would remember it and it would give you, you know, the answer for that. If it didn't see that problem, it would generalize and say, oh, they're showing me some numbers and I know what a number is and I, so I want to generate a number of the right form, but it didn't really know what addition was. And what's remarkable is, so they tested this on two-digit addition and subtraction, three-digit, four-digit, and five-digit. The big models, uh, they're not quite doing it completely right, so they're not really learning the full addition algorithm. But they're doing, you know, in, in some cases quite well. Uh, and so they seem to be generalizing beyond just rote memorization. And so what exactly they're doing is not so clear, but there's a kind of emergent behavior coming out in these big models, which goes beyond a sort of associative memory. Steve, I have a question on this one. So, I mean, it's striking how you go from these 13 billion parameters to 175 billion in order to get uh, the reasonable results. I mean, what is the thinking in this community that um, the, the scale of resources required for it to actually solve any real world problems seems, uh, you know, way out there to me. Uh, I guess, is it a view that uh, Moore's Law will bail us out so it's okay? Uh, just keep throwing these resources at it, getting these answers, and eventually we would be able to deploy this because uh, Moore's Law will keep uh, answering that question. I mean, is there any thought on the pragmatic level of the scale of these things vis-a-vis -vis actual deployment? You know, actually, you know, the, these are big, but, um, but they're not that big for inference. Once it's trained, the training is very expensive. And, very, uh, and so that's clearly, but I think big companies see that as the, you know, part of their competitive edge. If they can afford a bigger training regime, bigger training data, then they can get better models that are very hard for others to duplicate. And um, these models can actually be compressed quite a bit. There's a whole industry of distillation and uh, there are various variants of transformers which use um, uh, locality sensitive hashing to speed them up. And so once you have a trained model, you can often uh, compress it down to fit on a much smaller machine. And in fact, there are transformer models running on cell phones right now. And so I don't know how long it would be before you could take a model like this and put it on the cell phone, but I don't, it's not totally out of, out of uh, possibility. Certainly running it in a data farm for something like a, an Amazon Alexa, uh, I think it would be totally practical for inference in that kind of a setting. So question, um, somewhere along the line of the internet, it probably found a multiplication table somewhere. So the question is, what would drive a model like this to, to drive uh, questions like uh, arithmetic toward you know, a compact solution? Yeah, I think that's really a central question that 
uh, you know, we barely have any understanding of what the representation of uh, operations is inside these models. And, um, and I don't think anybody really knows what their computational capacity is either. I started looking at the self-attention operation, and I believe, you know, if you handcraft it, I believe that would be sufficient to actually represent, I think it's computation universal uh, if you use it in the right way. Uh, but whether, you know, backprop learning through self-attention can learn, say, a, a real addition algorithm, it's not even clear there. And uh, somebody took GPT-2 and trained it on chess problems, and they they had it playing chess. Not very good chess, but it could it could play uh, a something of a game of chess. And so, so it's weird, you know, the, these strange uh, models that are sort of halfway between just general purpose neural nets, and they have uh, something of a computational element in them. I'm guessing these are this very early days, and that there are going to be new variants of these, which will be much more um applicable especially to this kind of task and here it's like they're asking this thing a language model to do the stuff that it really shouldn't be doing arithmetic kind of to see to probe it like how you know how is it doing uh, steve uh, i remember i think um when i read the paper that in this specific test they mentioned that they look for the operations that they were trying to predict and they only found i think less than one percent in the data set so there's, there might be some level of generalization there. Oh yeah, I definitely think it's generalizing. It's not just that it's, you know, especially when you get up to five digit addition, very few of the five digit, five digit addition problems could actually be out there in the internet. Um, so it's, you know, but it may be doing it in a fairly simple way. Like it's, you know, doing the two digit addition on the first two digits, you know, it's doing, it's combining, it's combining knowledge it has about elements uh, in some way. Uh, and so in some sense, you know, somebody should really nail this. Like what exactly is it doing? And I think this is still early days, so we don't really know quite that. But yeah, that's a great point, that it's gotta be generalizing in some way. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I had another question I actually asked back then, but I, I didn't realize it was on mute. <laughs> so when, when you were talking about um, how to learn a general AI, so here we are talking specifically about the language model. So what do you think about uh, the way forward uh, to use this in image as well? Like, uh, I imagine we have to do some grounding like map language representation to uh, features in the visual domain. And if we can do that, we could maybe even reason about the visual domain, but in the, the space of words. And then we can figure out things in the visual domain just reasoning about it on words, which would be similar to what we humans do, right? Like we think uh, a horse has uh, four legs and a ponytail, and then if I can reason about, if I can identify four legs and a ponytail, and I know uh, reasoning the space of words that that makes a, a horse, then I can classify that image as a horse. So you see that uh, happening, like moving uh, forward with these models? Oh, absolutely. I think that's super important, uh, combining language and vision. And also, um, I, I just we just we have a little reading group. We just read papers on combining language with reinforcement learning also that uh, often there's language involved in tasks where you're trying to plan to, you know, certain activities. But yeah, there's a lot of people, um, you know, in some sense, uh, image processing and video processing, I think moved ahead, ahead of uh, natural language for a number of years there. And uh, so they're really good now at recognizing, you know, specific objects and people and facial expressions, all that kind of stuff. And tying it together with these language models, um, absolutely critical. Uh, one interesting thing, um, somebody did some experiments with much smaller models where they trained an English model and trained a French model. And then they found with no examples of this English is this French, but just from the relationships between the representations those two models found, they were able to align them and, do, and build a translation model. And so uh, I have a suspicion that, that something like that may also be possible in the visual domain and the language domain. So, you take a language model like this, which has discovered certain categories and relationships. You do that, you do a visual uh, model, which you know, identifies objects and certain relationships. And then you look for you know, sort of correspondence between the two models. You may be able to actually get an alignment between language, you know, ground the language in the physical reality without ever having trained it. And so uh, you know, I, don't, I don't know of anybody having done that. And clearly I think it would be better to train them together. And so I expect that, you know, 
next version down the line, they're going to be, and probably Google is doing this, just running every YouTube video through it, where you have both language and video, um, and building complex models that have both uh, uh, vision and language in them at the same time. I, clearly, I think that's that's the next step. And whether the transformer thing and self-attention is sufficient, um, you know, the the um, the image transformer that OpenAI just just released like two weeks ago is really interesting in that regard because they they use exactly the same model for the, in the image domain, and it seems to be capturing uh, visual data pretty well. So. <laughs> Uh, maybe that is a sort of universal learning element. Uh, I'm guessing that more is going to be needed, particularly around the issues of planning and stuff that we were talking and reasoning that we were talking about. But, but it, I think it looks like you can do a lot with just that simple element. Uh, there's another, a, there's little, actually oh, yep. sorry, there's actually some early work on that on uh, learning this uh, mapping language representation to words, learning uh, for example the inner probe just mapping those those two representations. But it's not at the point that's actually useful. Uh, so, yeah, uh, my, my question, I think you just answered is that, is this going to just make uh, computer vision models uh, go forward, like go to the next step, right? The next image, the next step. Yeah. You know, I think where it's really going to help is um, the vision models are doing pretty well when you have known classes of objects. But I don't think they're getting all that, you know, there's a lot more deeper semantics in, in natural language right now. And so if you could tie all of that knowledge in natural language, like, you know, it's not just a person is smiling, a person is joyous, you know, uh, because they just were given a gift or something. That, that that kind of thing is hard to do in a pure visual way. But combining it with language, I think, I think we're going to get real richness of semantics on both ends. So word scrambles, another simple little thing. They just take words and they scramble the letters and it's supposed to unscramble them similar kind of phenomena. They have a whole bunch of examples like that. Um, so, so because this thing seems to be showing characteristics which were unexpected, there's a lot of controversy online and also in, in discussions about, well, how powerful is this thing? Is it really just learning things? Is it just a, you know, kind of scrambling up the internet, remembering it and spewing it out? Or is it doing something more? Uh, and there are uh, opposing factions that are forming. So one um, a blogger who goes by the name Gorn had did a lot of experiments with GPT-2 and has been recently doing a bunch with GPT-3. He actually thinks that this may be sufficient, scaled up, say, by another factor of 100, to have emergent behavior which starts looking like uh, you know, general intelligence. And so he's sort of in the, the camp, not saying that it will happen, but that it's a possibility and that we should be prepared that this kind of model may lead to general intelligence, you know, in the, in the matter of, of years rather than a long time. On the opposite side, um, here's a, uh, a well-known um, uh, linguist, Emily Bender, who does a lot on linguistics uh, semantics. And she just came out with a paper arguing that this kind of model is not in, in principle not able to actually capture real meaning. And uh, like a, a typical sentence from that paper is, we argue that the language modeling task, because it only uses form as training data, cannot in principle lead to learning of meaning. And so clearly there's a divide in what uh, people think about uh, what meaning is and where it comes from. And so that's very interesting. Um, we talked about those. Just to give a couple more examples, these are some things that Gorin has been doing recently with GPT-3 that I thought were amusing. Um, in the, in the image domain, people have been able to do something they call style transfer for a while, which is you take a, uh, a photograph of something, somebody's face, and then you show it a Van Gogh painting, and you say, apply the style of the Van Gogh painting to this image. And you could do a pretty good job using uh, GANs, uh, style GAN or something like that, of doing this, you know, separating the, the meaning, meaning of the content from the style of the content. So far, nobody's really been able to do that with text that I, I am aware of. And yet with GPT-3, all you do, so he did a bunch of experiments where he said, summarize the Harry Potter story, which I guess it has read, it knows about online, in the style of different authors. And so here's Harry Potter in the style of Ernest Hemingway. And he started it off so that it, uh, the, the, the um, bolded text is what he gave it, and the other text is what it generated. So it was a cold day on Privet Drive, a child cried. Harry felt nothing. He was drier than dust. He had been silent too long. He had not felt love. He had scarcely felt hate. 
Yet the Dementor's kiss killed nothing. Death didn't leave him less dead than he had been a second before. And it goes on. It's sort of like, wow, that's pretty good. And then he asked him to, to do the same thing, summarize Harry Potter in the style of Jane Austen. And it generated, it is the truth universally acknowledged that a broken Harry is in want of a book. This he knows to his cost, pressing that wretched nose against the window of a bookstore in Diagon Alley, the last thing before he goes into hiding for several years, whereupon he goes straight to Azkaban. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like, wow, you know, even, even the idea of doing this is sort of shocking. And the fact that you can get it to do that with just that little bit of context is pretty amazing. And it was never trained, obviously, to do any sort of a style trend. It's just trained to predict the next word. That's all that's it is. Yeah, it knows that's nothing that's about this as a task. And yet you, you describe it in you know, a, a sentence or two, and it does a kind of credible job of it. So in, the, in this case, uh, I mean, mechanistically, it's given the bolded text as a sequence of you know, these uh, pairs, these tokens. Tokens, yeah. And then it's just asked to predict the next token. Yep. And then you, get, then you include that next token in, and then you predict the next one, and so on. Well, I, I, uh, that's all be, it. it has to be more than that, because it's including things such as the words specific to the Harry Potter stories that are not in those first three sentences. Yeah, but it must have already learned it from the from from. No, but I think set. somehow it must be told. I mean, it must be told. Take this Harry Potter book or something. I mean, I don't know what it's doing. It's but like that, that's in the. All that's told is right here. It says the novel series Harry Potter. That's its okay. instruction. <laughs> mm. And it's got it's got Harry Potter in its weight somehow. <laughs> so it's weird. It's a really weird setting. <laughs> so I have a, a question. Um, in the context of where it's trying to make the prediction, if it gets, let's say, it doesn't have a very high probability of any of the choices it has, would that be a pretext for it to actually be able to formulate a question back out? Oh, that's an interesting question. You know, when you generate text from these, um, th there are various ways to do that. It, it's giving you a probability distribution over next word. If you just take the highest probability word, sometimes that can generate uh, aberrant uh, things. It can generate sentences that cycle. And so they often do what they call a beam search, where maybe you take the 10 highest probability words and you, tr you uh, track them on a, a little bit and, and you, you sort of find the the highest probability sequence. And so I'm not exactly sure um, if, you know, if they're doing anything like that here. Uh, yeah, well, but, uh, a variation on, on a simple variation of that is, is to look at, you know, the two highest probability and if they're nearly co-equal in magnitude, then, you know, note that there's an ambiguity and whether that would be enough to, to, to say, here's two possibilities, which one, you know, and, and therefore feed, I mean, you could think of, I'm trying to incorporate the exploration aspect of, you know, by going out to a, uh, a distiller, i.e. a human, <laughs> you know, and basically say, okay, this is ambiguous to me. How would you differentiate that? And whether, I mean, if you can imagine automated that in some particular way, then you could, you know, but it's where do you get the distiller from? It would, it would have to be crowdsourced humans or something. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You can definitely do that. There's a, a really nice, um, there's a group called Hugging Face. Uh, it's a startup company that does natural language and they have uh, created, I think it's 10 or 15 different transformer models, BERT and GPT-2. I don't, they don't have GPT-3 yet. Um, and they, they have a, uh, a GitHub repo with all the weights and everything. You can just run it. And they also have online something called Talk to Transformer where you can play with it. And in one version of that, it shows you, I think the top 10 um, successive words and you can use it as a as an author's tool so that you can write something and it'll show you what it thinks the next best word might be. And you can either pick that or put your own thing in and, and uh, sort of explore in that way. So I think there are a gazillion ways of using this kind of tool to enhance and to include human input, uh, you know, in, in actually doing something useful, like you maybe, you know, want to generate news stories or something. You could maybe just have it generate the story, but it's probably better, like you say, to have a human in there, you know, curating it and, and guiding it in some way. And the, and the best way to interact with these things in terms of products, I think is totally unclear at this point. And so I think there's a whole new kind of technology that could emerge from this. 
So I'll give you just one more example because it's super amusing, which is there are a bunch of uh, critics of this. And so uh, Doug Hofstetter, uh, actually an old friend of mine, um, uh, wrote to Gerd Escherbach and is a real, uh, you know, champion of understanding deeply how language and, and the, the mind works. And I think he rails against these kinds of statistical models, really hates it. And then Gary Marcus is somebody else who's written a whole bunch of things uh, sort of criticizing these deep learning models uh, as basically missing some of the essence. Uh, and so I don't know if they wrote this together or whether this was just something that um, uh, the guy who was testing it did it. But he started off an essay about how AIs could never be creative and never have good language. And then he asked GPT-3 to continue it. And so the continuation is, they will never be able to truly understand the underlying meaning of things. Additionally, we still don't have programs that can truly imagine or create new things all by themselves in a natural way, but rather just brute force through random strings of garbage until they happen to hit upon the correct solution to the current problem. We still lack a Rosetta Stone for the universe and don't really know what things like light, sound, matter, gravity, life, free will, and consciousness are. So I just thought it was amusing that that paragraph was generated by a statistical AI. <laughs> well, I wonder what would happen, happen if you... End, I think, and we can have further discussion of any kind, depending on what your timing is. I have a question, which is, you know, we have a natural language partner who has done a lot of work on this um, using sparse representations. And that's a lot of what we're doing in our own work now is with sparsity. Have these guys looked at all at sparse representations as a part of what they're doing to, uh, you know, get better context or better performance or anything that you know of? Well, in some sense, like the the um, uh, self attention module has a, a softmax in there uh, that tends to create sparsity. That's something which, in, uh, and so if you look at what the attention weights are, it's they typically are only have two or three words that have appreciable weights on them. And so the attention th operation naturally has sparsity. And I think a lot of the vector representations tend to be sparse as well, that they tend to capture, uh, you know, represent different semantic uh, things in different parts of the vector. And these are pretty big vectors. And so, uh, but actually adding in a sparsity, say, as an extra weight in the backprop, that I could imagine that would actually make things work better and, and lock in on more on tighter semantic information. It'd be interesting to experiment with it. Uh, Steve, you, you talk a little bit about inference. Uh, do you have any idea how long it takes like on a single GPU to do inference for a 500 uh, paragraph, considering you have been searched with uh, K equals 10, for example, that's 5,000 words inference. You know, I don't know much about this, the GPT-3. On GPT-2, it's very rapid. Um, you know, uh, a few milliseconds kind of thing. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Also, you know, um, the GPUs have been getting better. NVIDIA keeps cranking out more and more powerful GPUs. And so, uh, and one of the reasons that people are so excited about the transformer architecture is that it maps pretty well onto a GPU. That the attention mechanism that they chose, part of the reason they chose it is that you can run it as, you know, dense uh, matrix multiplies. Uh, and so they, they work pretty well with current GPUs. Um, I wonder what would happen if you gave it a prompt that was kind of syntactically correct nonsense. Like, uh, like you know, in Rick and Morty or these sci-fi shows where they come up with words like, oh, the schlorper went on the bring brong, you know, sort of thing. You see, like something that it wasn't, because if, when I see, for example, this, uh, prompt return from Douglas Hofstadter, you know, that's like a pretty well-known book. Uh, and Doug Hofstadter, uh, sorry, Gordel Escherbach, I mean, uh, and, you know, there's going to be a lot of his writings on the internet, which are presumably somewhere in the weights uh, of, of GPT-3. So I wonder, like, if you, if there is such a thing that isn't in the weights of GPT-3. Um, and, you know, yeah. and is this like, like the approach that these people, uh, this old AI uh, approach that, like, you know, try to lay out every possible cognitive concept and list it and put it into the model. Yeah, it seems to be much more flexible than that. If you go to this, uh, this website here, this uh, Gorn, uh, he did a bunch of weird experiments. And so in particular, he asked it to generate puns and it creates its own words and, uh, and you know. Okay. So it does a lot of that and exactly how it's doing it and what it's doing. Um, 
you know, it's it's funny. It's 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 sort of like interacting with with something different that we haven't seen before. Yeah, they they yeah. have a, a few examples uh, even in their paper where they kind of define a nonsense word right in the sequence, and then they ask it to generate a sentence on that. So they have an example like, um, you know, a gigamuru is a type of Japanese musical instrument. An example of a sentence that uses the word gigamuru is colon, and then it has to fill in, and it fills in something like, I have a gigamuru that my uncle gave me as a gift. I love to play it at home. <laughs> so it's able to kind of do those kind of substitutions anyway, and kind of and clearly, you know, there's no Giga Maru in, on the web. So that reminds you know. me of a party game we play. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They, they also do it the other way where they uh, they use the word in sentence and ask for the dictionary, dictionary definition and it comes out the same. So you can do it both ways. Or so you just make up some random thing and ask it to come yeah. up with a yeah, word? Yeah, you, like you write a few sentences with the word and you ask for the dictionary definition and it will give you a dictionary definition, which makes sense. Or you can do the other way, what you're saying, you, you do the dictionary definition and then you ask to make up a few sentences and then it makes sense. It works both ways. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> My intuition, uh, I would not have guessed that this kind of system could do that. And so I would, there's still a big gap in my own understanding. How on earth is it doing that? You know, it, yeah. so I'm hoping that people will start probing this thing, like take some task like that and figure out exactly what kind of knowledge it's getting at each layer and, and, and tease apart. How is it doing that? You know, so. It's, it's able to solve these kind of SAT analogy tests. Uh, exams, I think, almost at the level of a uh, of a uh, human. Yeah, I think it's higher higher than the average, right? That's what they say. Oh, is it okay? <laughs> I don't know if we'll get into Yale yet, but uh, it's it's <laughs> getting up there. Uh, one thing that I see in the near future, if you ground this uh, language models to image, is that you can probably create movies or games with these generative models. You just write the text, and you can generate the the image from the text, right? It seems like a very good application. And game industry is huge, movie industry is huge, and you can just save a lot of costs with this. Yeah, I mean, NVIDIA has been doing some remarkable stuff where you draw a little sketch of something and it makes a photorealistic image of that thing. And then like you're saying, I've seen a little bit of people taking text descriptions and generating uh, images and, and videos from that. Does that mean that future movies will suddenly be, you know, on the fly created? You know, you, maybe you give it a topic and it, it generates a movie for you? I mean, <laughs> remarkable. That would be the analogy of dreaming, I would think. Mm. I'm curious. Uh, so most of the talk has been about GPT-3. Uh, and the other one you've mentioned a few times is BERT. And I'm just curious if you have a perspective on um, is GPT-3 uh, like better or does it just demo better? Uh, I'm, I'm curious if you just have a perspective on that. Yeah, so BERT is a different architecture. So GPT-3 is an auto regressive uh, language model. So it is trying, it, its basic thing is to give probabilities of the next word and it's trained on trying to predict the next word. BERT is better to think of as a denoising autoencoder. And so the way they train it is they give it sentences and then they block out 15% of the words. And then it goes, it tries to compress it into a new representation and then regenerate it. And it's supposed to generate the original sentence. And so that's its training model. So it's a sort of a different framing. And the, the advantage of BERT, or one advantage, is that it can use both the context before and after a word. And that, I think, gives it more power in terms of learning. But uh, it's harder to train. And the most the uses of BERT that I've seen have all been you train the language model, and then you have to train it again on the specific task. And so I haven't seen people doing the kind of thing that they're doing with GPT-3. Um, maybe they are, and I'm just not aware of it. And so my sense is that BERT, that BERT architecture in general should be more efficient in using data, but that it's more complicated. The BERT the thing is pretty, tr pretty tricky. And so it looks like, whereas GPT-3 is sort of the simplest thing you can imagine in a way, and it seems to be working well. So I'm not sure you get a lot of benefit from the BERT thing, but you know, I, I'm sure both, both channels are gonna be moving forward and uh, we'll learn more about what architectural features are really important. 
Don't you think it's fair to say if you train 170 billion uh, BERT model, it's going to be better than the auto regressive, just based on the what we have now? That would be my guess, but I, I, I'm not sure if it's as easy to train and, and if you could use it in the same way. Like, I'm not sure if BERT can generate text in quite the same way that GPT does. Um, yeah, it, it may not be as, I, I don't know, if, just the way it's set up, could you actually just give it random prompts and have it fill in stuff without, uh, you know, training it specifically for a particular task? Yeah, I don't have a sense of that. Mm. One of the real hard real world translation problems has uh, Chinese kind of stands out because there's a, a vast amount of context uh, in it and it's kind of resisted normal efforts. Do you know whether they've applied uh, either BERT or GPT-3 to uh, Chinese translation? Oh, that's interesting. I, I'm sure, you know, China has been doing their own versions of these models. True. And I'm sure they probably have. I have not seen any uh, literature on that, but... Uh, uh, yeah, it'd be interesting because China, I think, has a different, like I've heard that there are things you can say in Chinese that don't translate well into English. Uh, I used to like to look at the Tao Te Ching um, and look at, there are like 80 translations of the Tao Te Ching. You take multiple translations and you try and see the corresponding text. And in English, they just sound totally different. And so it'd be really interesting to know what uh, these language models would do in trying to align uh, two very different languages like that. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a follow up question. So, um, so you talk a little bit about reinforcement learning and do you know of any work or your work of using uh, reinforcement learning to, to fine tune this, these language models to a, a, a reward function which is defined by humans? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think in fact- Could you, um, could you state that question? I didn't follow the question. Um, if, use it, using reinforcement learning to improve uh, uh, language generation and tie it more to human uh, needed things. I mean, one area is chatbots. Chatbots are still pretty bad. And um, Google came out with something called Mina, which tried to use uh, some of these transformer things to make a better chatbot. And I've heard that it's pretty good, but I think it's still not really, you know, something that you would want to talk to for very long. They tend to lose context over, you know, I think after 15 interactions, they kind of forget what you talked about before. They don't have a very good model of the user. They're not very empathetic. They don't really know what you know and don't know. And all of that, I think reinforcement learning could help a lot with. And so I would love to see a much better integration of reinforcement learning, really planning how to interact with a person or with some, in other, some other system together with the rich kind of semantic knowledge that these models uh, have, seem to have. I keep trying to think about, you know, what are the limits of this kind of paradigm? Um, you know, it, you, you could argue that maybe GPT-3 has been trained pretty much on all of the text that's on the web or maybe close to that. Um, you know, is that sufficient to, you know, solve the Turing test? Uh, is it sufficient to create something that can generalize and really seem intelligent? Not that the Turing test is a good test of intelligence, but um, you know, to the extent that you can interact with something in, in text, uh, you know, what, what are your, you know, what are the limits of this? Um, you know, I, I was kind of thinking of the same thing, but where my head was going on that was novelty and inference. And it's like, can it really infer things that it's not been trained on? I mean, you know, like one of the things Jeff talks about a lot is staplers. Okay, you learn about how a stapler works. Maybe it knows how a stapler works. Do you know that you shouldn't staple your hand and put a staple in your hand? How are you going to know that? I mean, you as a human, you can inference that. Um, I would expect it wouldn't be able to make an inference on that. It's just not something that's likely to be in the corpus there of somebody stapling their hand. You know, I, I just, I feel like I, I, I'm, I have a tough time imagining how it handles novelty. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, my, my own sense is that multi-stage reasoning is, is its weakness that um, things, you know, the kind of reasoning that it finds directly uh, and then slight generalizations of that, like the staple in your hand, uh, like I could imagine it would get uh, the idea that, um, you know, uh, s sticking a pointy thing through your body part is painful and that's not good and that a stapler, you know, might be like that. So maybe it could do that. 
um, but certainly other kinds of problems which require two or three steps of inference, um, I think it's, it's weak on, as we see with the addition kind of problem that, that um, uh, it, it seems to beginning to chain together these things. I know there's a lot of research on how do you do multi-stage inference in a differentiable way through, di through knowledge bases. Um, and so I think that ties to the Kahneman uh, uh, fast and thinking fast and slow that uh, if we think of this thing as basically doing the kind of one step inference, um, then let's say, let's say we, we gave it the question of, you know, is it okay to staple your hand? Um, that might require two or three steps of inference, you know, that, um, you know, uh, uh, take something like it's bad to stab yourself, that that causes damage to your tissue, um, staples are pointy, the, the way a stapler works. You know, so you might be able to find a chain of uh, statements which lead to that, but I'm guessing it probably wouldn't do it on its own in the current status. And so combining it with something with a bit more reasoning planning, you know, multi-step uh, thing might, might get you to that stage. It, it seems to me that if you combine with a reward-based model, and then What's you can- What's cool is we can test a lot of these ideas and, you know, Oh, sorry. We no, can test all these ideas if we can access like prompts to GPT-3. I was wondering, like it, I did a quick Google and um, like it doesn't seem to be readily available, but I might've just missed it. Uh, it's on the, there's an open AI website where you can apply for access to their API. And I think they're eventually intending to sell or rent, you know, you, know, you, you pay per, pay per uh, access. And I heard a little bit, you know, Microsoft and, and OpenAI are sort of uh, working together. I'm guessing Azure will get a version of this, but it sounds like Google is going to do it. So I think, you know, in a year or two, there are going to be a bunch of models like this out there. You know, the code for this is pretty teeny. You look at, you go to Hugging Face, the, the Python code is maybe 10 pages, something. Uh, the compute power is huge and the data set is huge, but, uh, you know, it's not, not complicated to write these models. To, to go back to Donna's question, uh, so it seems to me that if you combine this with a reward-based uh, model, what you can do is you can have uh, the generative model generate like an action embedding, the action for the next time step, and your reward-based model is going to learn a policy, which is just a sequence of actions, and then you, you can do planning on, on, a, on longer uh, sequence of time based on this uh, reward. So you can actually use that as a component, as like the model of the word, in the reasoning uh, process. I think that's very interesting that, you know, in some sense, I think where reinforcement learning is going is they need to deal with hierarch hierarchical uh, plans. They need to deal with sub plans and language sort of has all that in it. And so it really seems like they could benefit one another. Um, and so I would love to see, I mean, one of the ways of thinking of GPT-3 is that's sort of a black box. You can just give it, phrases and it'll tell you probabilities, extensions, that this, that, and then compare two phrases, which one's more likely. Can you use it as a black box inside some kind of planning system or, or reinforcement learning system? That would seem to be a really interesting, you know, uh, easy way to, to, to make forward progress. You know, Jeff has a uh, speaking for Jeff again, <laughs> Jeff has a, a thought exercise for, you know, an intelligent system as, you know, which is, you know, would you be comfortable taking an AI system like this, putting it on a spaceship, sending it to another galaxy and have it explore and, you know, create, you know, figure out which uh, planets are habitable, setting up, uh, uh, you know, landing on the planet and, and setting things up there. Well, for we, we can make it simpler yeah. and just say we need, okay, to build a habit, we need to build a habitat on Mars. And so let's send a bunch of uh, robots, AI robots. Well, Mars is it. a little easier because we know a lot about Mars. Uh, yeah, yeah, but there'll be the problem is when they get there, they have to solve problems that weren't anticipated. They have to right. uh, improvise, things are going to break, you know, they have to coordinate with each other. I mean, we're talking like, you know, okay, but you could send another galaxy too. But <laughs> Like, so I guess the question is, could a system trained this way be sufficiently intelligent that you'd feel comfortable that, that it could go to another planet and set up a habitat? Hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it sort of encapsulates the novelty question well, as well. Well, it's and, not only a novelty. I mean, it gets back to the whole sensory motor thing before, you know, the artificial and general intelligence in humans is a very much a sensory motor problem, you know. Um, 
just set the table at dinner, right? It's a pretty simple task. That's a sensory motor problem. Where do you put the plates? Where do you do this? Where do you do that? What's on the table? Do you have to clean it off? You know, it's like a zillion things we do to do something very simple like that. And um, so much of what we do in the world is a sensory motor problem. And much of it is dealing with uh, things that will not, uh, that statistically are not represented anywhere. Uh, so the current arrangement of plates on my dinner table, uh, where, the, where the potatoes are versus the green beans versus the pizza or whatever, changes night to night. And, and I have to build a model of that it, very rapidly when I went to the room. I have to update my model when I move the plates around on the table. Um, so these are, these are not things I will find statistically described anywhere. Um, and they're very interactive. So there's this sort of a very, very fast temple of modification of the models we have in the world. Um, that are not described anywhere. We have to experience them and learn them. And we have to learn them through sensory motor interaction. I can't learn them through language. Um, I have to learn them by walking into the room and seeing things and picking things up and so on. And the tasks that we need for general intelligence uh, also are very sensory motor related. Um, so I think when we look at the statistical models of the world, like you're talking, which are really just statistical models of the world. I mean, we can argue how good they are, but they're statistical models of the world. There's no, there's no I don't think there's any debate about that. Um, um, they have various shortcomings when it comes to sort of real world behavior of humans or intelligent agents. And, you know, the, the, the tasks that we feel apply them to, which are really impressive, I mean, I, I agree, they're very impressive results. Um, they only apply them to those tasks that, that can be done with statistical models of the world in some sense. They, they don't apply them to things that require tremendous flexibility um, and uh, very rapid learning uh, of the world. Yeah, uh, those, those are, I, I totally agree. Great points. Though, you know, to, to sort of push back a little bit, imagine um, from natural language description of tables and plates and you can push forks around, I could imagine you could build like a little physics simulator um, with a simulated uh, dining table with simulated forks. And then you'd have to be motivated to, to do things in that world, but you could then sort of operate in that simulated world and sort of learn the kinds of actions you might take. And so that would be a path perhaps to take this seemingly yeah. pure language stuff and turn it into something more physical. Maybe, that maybe. It's a very interesting question. You know, much of, I've always believed that we don't learn about the world through language. We learn about certain things about the world through language. Uh, and most of what we know about the world, we don't, we, we learn through observation of other sorts. It can be observations, auditory, tactile, visual. And so um, I'll use, um, you know, I, I have an example, it just takes something like, I, I use my bicycle a lot, I ride my bicycle every day, and it makes sounds, right? It makes various sounds, and I know these sounds. I know the sound that it makes when I click down the kickstand, I know the sound it makes when I turn a gear, I know the sound it makes when I chain it a certain way, I know the sound, that, all these little sounds I know about it. And they're in my model of the bicycle. I don't have words to describe those sounds. I don't even have words to describe the things that are making the sounds. I, I kind of know that, yeah, this thing exists over here, but I may never know what the word for it is. So maybe if someone else does, I don't know. But I don't learn, I don't learn, learn the world through language. I learn some things through language. Um, obviously, we communicate a lot of knowledge that way. But the point is, it's not that, I think that's not the be critical of these models. I, uh, I think when you think about language, you can only capture some parts of the world through language. Um, there are knowledge that we individually have that is not expressed in language. So that's sort of a, a limit to the modality of the, of the system you're building with. Um, um, it's not an inherent limit, perhaps, of how these systems work in general. That's why I asked you earlier um, how these, these models apply to other things. Uh, I just, I think we just should, I think, you know, from my perspective, if we really want to create artificial general intelligence, we have to have these systems applied to sensory motor systems, systems with tactile inputs, inputs with auditory inputs, inputs with sensory, um, auditory, you know, visual inputs. Um, and these systems have to be active agents in the world, and they also have to learn very, very rapidly. They have to, it, it cannot be based on uh, statistics on lots of data. You can only learn so much about the world that way. Much of what we learn about the world is not like that. It's just like, hey, this is something new. You never saw this before. <laughs> or this is a new arrangement of things. Or this is a new behavior that Subutai exhibited today. You know, what happened to Subutai? You know, that kind of stuff. Nothing happened to Subutai. Um, Maybe another uh, version of that, uh, another kind of problem, Steve, that you and I are very familiar with. <laughs> just, you know, take, take three dots on, a, on an image. You know, can you tell is this an equilateral triangle or not? Like, could you learn this purely through a passive uh, mechanism? 
I, I, it seems know, like you might be able to do that. Why, why would? Because that's stuff that that's stuff that is statistically in the world someplace, right? I it mean, is, but you wouldn't find every possible combination of three dots or, or let's say four dots in a square yeah, or five dots yeah. in a pentagon. And you yeah. have to kind of understand the relations. You have to have, in order to know it's an equilateral triangle, you have to understand the relations between these three dots, not yeah. so much explicitly the, the yeah. three dots themselves. Yeah. So it's, it's, well, <laughs> it needs I a mean, location as, space of some as sort. As Steve showed, there's a lot of surprising things these systems yeah. can do. Um, but I would argue at a level, at some level, there's statistics in the world know what equilateral triangles are. It, it is in language someplace. It is in visual images places. And so in, at some theoretical yeah, possibility. Yeah, but could it generalize? Like, with, yeah, but without yeah. a location space, could it generalize? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I was trying to pick examples where this, the, the, the statistics of the models um, are, are not generally statistically reliable. They're out, they're changing all the time. They're in different places. There are things that people have never described in language, places that people have never been. <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, um, you know, I, you know, that kind of thing, like, uh, yeah. yeah. But, yeah. but you know, it's, it, I, I'm not saying you're wrong. So it could be very hard to do that. But at least somehow the statistics are there um, in some, you know, weird way. <laughs> I mean, an another thing in, in line with what, what I, I think you're saying is smell. We have very impoverished language for smell. It's a huge, rich part of human experience. And for other animals, it's like their dominant sense. We have almost no words for smell. Yeah. Uh, strange. I don't understand why. Well, we, we have, we have, there's so much stuff we know that, that, that really doesn't exist in language at all. Yeah. Um, again, this is, that, that is a, uh, that argument is not a fundamental argument. That's more of a, just a practical argument about, well, is language sufficient? Um, but there is a huge number of things we know that we do not have words for. And, um, or the, and, or maybe they're not commonly shared. Maybe somebody, someone knows what the little doohickey on the, the little bike part is called, but I don't know what that is. <laughs> you know, I just, yeah. Well, you I can know. make a word up. <laughs> well, you could, but that's, that's my point. My point is knowledge is not, my knowledge of the world is not stored in language. Yeah. My model of the world is stored in a model uh, that I've recreated from my, my sensory motor interactions. And uh, I can apply language to my model. I can try to explain how I know what a stapler does. But I didn't learn a stapler through language. I learned a stapler by picking it up and opening it, flipping around and say, hey, look, this little plate on the bottom can reverse and makes a stapler go this way versus this way. Does everyone know that? I don't know. And, um, and so you, I don't have a word for that thing. I don't even have a word for making the stapler bend outward versus inward, you know? But there probably is a word, but I don't know. The point is, there's so much I know about the world that you learn through experience that uh, may never been reflected in language, and certainly not the way my brain works. My brain work isn't a list of language. I apply language to the models. The models exist as some re recreation or a storage of what I experienced. And this is our work here at Numen that we understand how that is happening. And, um, and then I can say, okay, given I know what it's, my model of a stapler exists, I can apply, try to apply words to it. I can say, okay, well, how would I describe that part? And how would I describe this action? But the knowledge about the action and knowledge of the parts doesn't exist in words. It's something I apply later. Yeah, um, I want to distinguish between kind of, I think, two different things. One is kind of the modality of the, of the sense. So we have sort of language versus vision versus auditory and so on. Yeah. But regardless of the modality, there's an independent thing, which is a purely passive way of learning through statistics or an active sensory yeah. motor loop. Yeah. And I think those are two orthogonal. Yeah, uh, we know, things, by the way, you know. for certain, Steve, that the brain learns through sensory motor interactions. I mean, this, oh, this absolutely. is not, not yeah. debatable. And we also know how it learns it. We know that it uses reference frames for storing knowledge about as you interact with the world, it keeps track of where everything is in a reference frame, much like an engineering CAD program or something like that. That's what's going on in the brain. And so knowledge is stored in reference frames. Um, and, uh, and our models are stored in reference frames. Now the question is, can you get to AGI with a system that doesn't have that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, I don't think so. Uh, I really don't. I just don't think you can. You can do a hell of a lot of impressive stuff, but as you point out, there needs to be limits to these things. You know, we finished that. We finished the paragraph from Hofstadter. That was pretty cool. What's the next paragraph? You know, what's the next book that Hofstadter is going to write? You know, ah, you know. Um, so you know, you're you're uh, you're you're, you're uh, Kenneman. What is it? The first and second. What's it called? Fast and slow thing. Um, um, so. Anyway, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating how far this stuff has gone. 
uh, amazing. I think you're expressing your amazement at it too. Uh, but it's, uh, but I, I, you know, personally, I don't think you're going to get to AG either. That's interesting. You know, I, I think biologically, um, it, it's certainly clear that biological organisms interact with the world, you know, dynamically. And that I think language, that whole language system was built on top of that. That language comes from social, uh, from trying to expand from the individual experience to a social experience. And um, it doesn't necessarily represent everything. Uh, and so uh, because it's our shared social mechanism, we think, some, so we can sometimes think it represents more than is actually going on. And so, yeah. um, so it's really interesting to see the evolution of language and how that fits in. Uh, yeah. cognition. And it's, it's also interesting because all these, a, all these AI systems today, almost every one of them, we interact with them through language. I mean, yeah. uh, it, you know, if you say, oh, okay, label this picture. Well, it's, like, it's giving us a word for it. But that word is an impoverished thing. If it says this picture is a cat, does it know that there are cat people and dog people? You know, does it know that the cat has a heart? <laughs> doesn't know the cat's co po uh, you know, toes need to be clipped, or they'll just ruin your furniture. I don't think it knows that. Now, maybe your language model might be able to figure that out a bit. I don't know. Um, but, you know, uh, yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. I forgot. Lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, Jeff, uh, j just to pitch in. So, say there is nothing that fundamentally prevents training this in another modality. So, let's say you're training like a hundreds, the same scale of training, but in like a 3D simulated world, something like that. And then the, the question well, becomes... Vision, vision system? Auditory system? Yeah, like vision systems, actual simulation. But, but with, with, an, uh, with, a act, with actions as part of it? Uh, yeah, with actions. As, as, okay, well, that's a whole different thing. Then you get that's, a sensory motor. Yeah. Yeah, but then the second question is, can you generalize to like out of domain distributions, things you've never seen before? And maybe the answer is they can't. But the, the solution they're proposing is that, okay, if I can't generalize to out of domain, maybe I'll just put everything in domain. I'm just going to train on everything which is out there, and then nothing's going to be out of domain, right? So that's well, also I mean, generalizing is the things that 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 have never been experienced before, right? Um, I, yeah, I, you know, I think it's, it's I think it's a little bit of red herring to, to focus on the generalization. I think it's more important to focus on the dynamic learning aspect, you know, learning new things rapidly that didn't exist before, and uh, building models of things that uh, that that there hasn't that didn't exist. Um, uh, because you can, if you have enough data, you might be able to generalize from enough data. Um, you might be able to say, here's six trillion things and which one is this closest to? <laughs> what action might be related to? Um, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, Lucas. I did, I should have. No, 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 that, 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 that's it. <laughs> I was going to say exactly that. I mean, uh, if, if, uh -huh. if, you have, if you have seen everything which is possible, then it's just a matter of interppolating. But, that's that's also a possibility. Yeah, but you know, so I, much I don't know. I mean, there's so many dimensions we can go down here. So let's let's take this, this the whole dimension of, of embodiment, right? We are we manipulate the world. We pick things up. We do things. We move around and so on. How does this apply to that? How do you make a robotic system that can go around and, and figure out how to put the chain back on the bicycle? No one's never been shown that before. You know, that physically can do that. Can ride the bicycle? Like, oh crap! Look, the chain fell off. Oh, I have to put it back on again. I mean, we're so far from that kind of interaction in these systems, um, which we're just we're, we're funneling all the knowledge through a language. Um, but maybe they, they've seen it, so that's my point. Let's say you train. Well, what does it mean to build... see it? I mean, to yeah, see it, I have it... to, I have to right. physically move my fingers and arms and appendages to, to stretch the chain and try not to get the grease on my pants. And I mean. You can't just see that. You have to, I'm asking you to do it, right? Actually okay. do it. Let, let me give you a, a thought, just an experiment. Let's say you, you train it on all YouTube videos out there and you have a simulation and your goal is to replicate in your simulation what is being done on the video. So you're learning how to do all those actions. So, so the, simulation, of, the simulation includes a robot, a robot with arms and legs and hands. Yes, it includes like a humanoid. And then it has to replicate what the YouTube video is doing. So there are going to be hundreds of videos out there where people are fixing bikes. So it's going to learn how to fix a bike. Okay, right? so that simulation of the robot has to have movable appendages. Yeah, and yeah it has full simulation. Okay, so now we're dealing with the sensory motor system uh, yeah. with all these moving parts, right? We're not close to that here in any of these systems. Not, not even no, no, remotely no. close to it. We don't, <laughs> even robots today can't do this stuff at all. So, um, so now I, I'm not saying you can't simulate 
what humans do. Uh, I think you can. I think we can build intelligent robotic systems. So um, I guess what I'm saying is they can't deal with, and you know, you're saying, could I just, by showing it every possible thing that ever happened, um, could you learn to, could it learn to do stuff like that? That's, that's why I gave the example of the plates on the dinner table earlier, because there is no statistics in the world that tells me how the plates are arranged on my dinner table right now. Right now, not, not in general, not typical, but right now, where's the, you know, the potatoes on my plate, on my table right now. Um, and I, so much of the world we deal with right now is like, I'm sitting here, oh, my coffee cup's over here, my mouse is over here, maybe they're different in a minute from now. And um, that kind of, you know, this interaction with the world, this mo and I have a model right now in my head where all these things are, I, I can't get that from statistics. You know, I had to learn it really quickly, rapidly in a second ago. Does that make sense? Uh, speak, you follow what I'm yeah, yeah. So uh, speaking of dinner, we have lunch coming up and I'm <laughs> conscious of the time. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, so we, uh, we have another meeting we have to get to, but uh, Steve, thank you so much for coming on. And I don't know why it took me 15 years to have you. That was a great talk, Steve. Thank I really you appreciate- so much, very interesting. I, I really appreciate you keeping it at the, the high level, philosophical level of the, and so the insights you had as opposed to it gets down in the, you know, the nuts and bolts of the details. It was really, really good.